Did you know that in Redshift for Cinema 4D, creating convincing anisotropic reflections is easier than you think? And even more complex effects, such as those radial micro scratches on worn metal, can also be easily created with just a few tricks up your sleeve. So, what are anisotropic reflections? The term isotropic, or the opposite anisotropic, refers to the reflection's roughness. Isotropic reflections have an even roughness in all directions, such as here on the plastic surface of the laptop. Anisotropic reflections, on the other hand, have a roughness stretched in a specific direction, such as here on this brushed metal surface. The reason for this is the microstructure of the surface, shaped by grinding, brushing or simply wear and tear. If the surface has uniformly large micro details or micro facets, the reflection roughness is isotropic meaning uniform in all directions. However, if the micro facets have an elongated shape and a common orientation, the reflection roughness is anisotropic, meaning stretched. If that's the case, the direction of the reflection is orthogonal to the micro facets orientation. Let's hop over to Cinema 4D and see our first example, this object from the Asset Browser. In Redshift, we create anisotropic reflections in the standard material node in the reflection area. As soon as we dial in a certain degree of reflection roughness, it is isotropic, uniform in all directions. With the anisotropy parameter, we can give the roughness a certain degree of stretching. Anisotropy therefore only takes effect as soon as we have a roughness above zero. The angle of stretching is controlled using the rotation parameter, which allows values between zero meaning 0 degrees, and 1, meaning 360 degrees. A rotation of 90 degrees would therefore correspond to a value of 0 0.25. Of course, anisotropy and rotation parameters can also be controlled via inputs, meaning texture or shader nodes. So let's take a look at our second example. Here, I use two separate materials, each on its own polygon selection. The first selection includes the vertical sides of the object. The corresponding material is applied with a matching cylinder projection and contains a max or noise node in UV vertex attribute mode. Let's solo it. The noise is small in size, strongly stretched and connected to the anisotropy port. This controls the amount and structure of anisotropy with the grayscale values of the noise. Then we control the rotation of the anisotropy manually according to the direction of the brushed structure, in this case 0.25 for a 90 degree rotation. So far, so good. The second selection includes the horizontal surfaces of the object. The corresponding material is applied with a suitable flat projection. In the material we use an image texture of radial scratches to control the amount of anisotropy. However, the direction of anisotropy is not yet radial. We fix this with a ramp node. In radial mode, this creates a corresponding gradient from white to black. Connected to the rotation port, this means a rotation of the anisotropy direction from white, meaning 0 degrees, to black, meaning 360 degrees. And since 0 and 360 degrees represent the same direction, the whole thing works completely seamlessly. For a proper anisotropic reflection, it is essential that Redshift knows the orientation of the surfaces involved. With less information on that, Redshift can only provide rough results that show errors or seams, such as here. In order to calculate better anisotropic reflections, we activate a somewhat hidden option in the standard material node. In the Advanced tab, we scroll down to Anisotropy and select the option from Tangent Channel in the Surface Orientation drop-down menu. This optimizes the calculation of the surface orientation at the cost of a slightly higher computing time. Artifacts and seams disappear. With that option, Redshift derives surface orientation information from normal directions, font parameters and even from the material projection in the material tag. The latter is important to keep in mind. Even if you use a very basic material without any shaders or textures in it, like with the material from the first example, the look of your anisotropy will change completely according to the material projection. Without the option from Tangent Channel, that's not the case and artifacts reappear. 
please note two things. The term tangent channel is somewhat confusing. It originates from one of Redshift's first host applications, namely Softimage, and in connection with Symbophody, it simply means the evaluation of additional orientation information. In the relevant fields, UV channel and tangent channel corresponding material or font text can be dragged in. However, this does not really improve anything in most cases and rather tends to be a source of calculation confusion. So stick with the from tangent channel option and correct font parameters and material projection. With this knowledge, let's take a look at a more advanced use case, pieces of great-grandmother's legacy silverware. The shading of the wand spoon and fork consists of three main components. Basic settings and coloring, anisotropic reflection and anisotropic radial microscratches. Let's take a brief look at the basic parameters and the coloring. The silver material is created with a specular workflow as it's more intuitive for artistic needs than the metalness workflow, at least to my mind. If you're not familiar with the terms specular and metalness, watch my video on this, link in the video description. The IOR is, typical for metals, a value far above the indices of dielectric materials, in this case the maximum of 32. Roughness is quite high at 0.5, by that the reflection is a hybrid between specular and diffuse reflection. Typical for the specular workflow, the coloring of the metal is exclusively done by the reflection area. Here, a color layer node is connected to the reflection's color board and contains the following components. A large beige and white noise, covered by a beige Fresnel shader, a texture painted in Photoshop for displacement and dirt, a noise masked to the handle in green and another one in brown both for oxidation stains, more noise-based splotches, a color gradient of violet and beige along the length of the spoon and a curvature shader interrupted by noise for brightening the edges. Important colored components, such as the oxidation stains on the handle, were created in two color variations each and mixed with a Fresnel node. This creates that typical viewing angle dependency of oxidation effects. Doing so, artistic control is more important to me than using the physically more correct thin film effect. The result is a credibly colored reflection that creates its own chromatic play depending on the viewing angle. On top, I use the color correct node, turning the coloration a little darker, richer in contrast and more desaturated. As we add reflective scratches on top later on, this will help preventing the overall result from being too bright. With this preliminary work we now dial in some basic anisotropy. First, we make sure that the option from tangent channel is selected in the advanced tab of the standard material node. Back in the base properties tab, we set anisotropy to just below the maximum value of 1 for strong but not too strong effect. For the rotation, we want something that runs orthogonal to the overall shape of the spoon and is therefore visually more prominent. The default zero degree rotation is ideal for this, so together with the reflection coloring, we have already created a credible metal. So far, so good. But for a truly realistic impression, there is something missing. Those famous micro-scratches gathering randomly and radially around bright reflections. We will now create these scratches, but on top of the reflection area in the coat area. Coat is nothing more than a second set of reflection parameters, ideal for adding scratches on top of a base reflection. As a first step, we connect the code color board to the previously created coloring of the reflection, but in a slightly desaturated version using a color correct node. Now, let's take a look at the setup of the scratches. The basis is the OSL scratches shader from the Redshift OSL repository on GitHub. If you're not familiar with the use of OSL for Redshift, watch my video on this. Link to the video and the shaders in the video description. The Scratches shader creates line-shaped scratches with customizable density, length and width based on texture coordinates. These scratches are then rotated and moved based on a noise function. 
The parameters in the same name tab are more or less self-explanatory, except for hard scratches and random. Hard scratches is an option we will leave activated for more crisp results and with random we can dial in numeric values for different random distributions. What's more interesting are the output ports. To take a look, we temporarily connect them to the output node. Roughness provides a grayscale output controlling the amount of reflection roughness. The basic roughness from the parameters tab is displayed as a background brightness here a light grey, and the scratches themselves are darker or brighter, represented by minimum and maximum roughness. Anisotropy provides the amount of anisotropic stretching per scratch, also as a grayscale output. Adjustments for this can be made in the parameters tab with minimum and maximum anisotropy. Rotation includes the angle of the anisotropic stretching also via grayscale values, resulting in different brightnesses per scratch. The underlying texture grid on which the distribution of the scratches is based is also providing input. Scratch gives an overall result of the shader. However, in a bump map node it only provides meaningful output if source is set to tangent space normal. That means if the scratch output is used as a normal map. For that radial effect, we need scratches that are dense enough and long enough. So, in the parameter step, we set a sufficiently high density and length of the scratches. However, it is noticeable that the scratches become shorter with increasing density. But for really long scratches, we cannot go beyond a maximum value of 10 in the parameter scratch length. The only option is to increase the overall size with a smaller scale value. Now the scratches are long enough, but we have also reduced the relative density again. So here we are going round in circles. We need a different solution for that. What we need are at least three scratches shaders with the same settings, but different random values, meaning different distribution variations. We will layer them, or to be precise their output ports, using a color layer node. Doing so, we end up with four color layer nodes for the four output categories Roughness, Anisotropy, Rotation and Scratch. Each color layer node contains three layers with Scratches Shader 1 plugged into Layer 1. Keep in mind, the layer mode of layer 2 and 3 is important to the result and is selected according to visual criteria. Roughness layers get added in layer mode multiply. Anisotropy layers get added in layer mode add. Rotation layers get added in layer mode lighten and scratch layers get added in layer mode add as well. We then connect the color layer nodes from roughness and isotropy and rotation to the corresponding parts in the code area of the standard material node. The scratch result, however, is placed in a bump map node in mode tangent space normal and with a very low height scale of 0.09. That's important to keep the normals effect crisp but subtle. For further processing, we make sure that all three shaders are always processed at once so that the parameters stay exactly the same, of course, except for the random value. Okay, the scratches are now dense enough, but their alignment still seems to be concentric rather than radial. And by looking at the shader's preview pic on GitHub, we see that's how it natively works. The result is exactly 90 degrees different from what we actually need. The solution is to compensate for exactly that 90 degree difference by simply using a math add node and adding the value 0.25, that means 90 degrees. That's it. The scratches now run radially around the reflection instead of concentrically. That was easy. After that, we increase the width of the scratches in all three shaders to 0.15. This increases their radial behavior around the highlight a little more. Finally, we reduce the code area's weight in the standard material node to 0.6. 
By doing so, we lower the opacity of our layered scratches and make the overall result a little more balanced. For adding some more spiciness, the following extras are included in the final setup. Extra scratches. In addition to the layered scratches shader, there are also some extra scratches here and there, only intended to provide a little extra roughness. These structures are based on an FBM noise with an increased cycles value, very strong high clip and a high scaling. The resulting stringy structures are then connected to a color layer node, multiplied to a base white and masked by a high contrast noise. The result looks good, but needs to be remapped using a ramp node. It is then added to the overall roughness output as an additional layer in the corresponding color layer node. Additional bump maps. The normal map of the layered scratches is spiced up with two other bump maps in a bump map blender. First, a bump map for worn edges. This shader is based on a curvature shader broken up by a small high contrast noise. Second, a bump map for some small damages. This shader is based on a small high contrast noise, multiplied on white in a color layer node and then masked by another high contrast noise. A tiny bit of diffuse reflection. As the worn silver is a hybrid of diffuse and specular reflection due to the high roughness values, we now reintroduce a very small amount of diffuse reflection. To do so, we connect the reflection coloring with the base color port and set the weight to a low 0.15. This increases the microdiffuse appearance and the sensitivity to shadows a little more. As a BSDF, we choose Dion Lambertian spheres for micro faceted surfaces. If you're not familiar with BSDFs, check out my video on this, link in the video description. Also in the video description is a high resolution image of the entire node setup, so check this out. We have now created a credible oxidized silver material with an anisotropic base reflection and a complex looking wear effect, including radial micro scratches. And the best thing is, it's all dishwasher safe. If you like this video, press the subscribe button and don't miss the next episode of Did You Know Ratchet for Cinema 4D exclusively on this channel.